I was a child, I was lucky to have parents who were adamant about teaching my brother and me about our history, Black history. Something we learned about early on was the unfulfilled promise of 40 acres and a mule made to newly freed slaves. What was meant to be compensation for generations of unpaid labor started the seemingly endless debate on reparations to African Americans. Hey out there, I'm Desi Lapool and I'm here to help us navigate the debate on reparations. Let's start in June 2019 when the House of Representatives held a congressional hearing on the issue of reparations to African Americans. Tanahasi Coates, a prominent Black intellectual and writer of the influential essay, The Case for Reparations, spoke about why the United States has yet to settle the issue of reparations to African Americans. It would seem ridiculous to dispute invocations of the founders or the greatest generation on the basis of a lack of membership in either group. We recognize our lineage as a generational trust, as inheritance. And the real dilemma posed by reparations is just that, a dilemma of inheritance. The modern reparations debate piqued my interest with this congressional hearing. It brought black politicians, intellectuals, and cultural figures on the national stage to make a case for reparations. Presidential candidates have even publicly expressed support for reparations on the campaign trail. It's interesting that it's now Reparations has become a public topic among the Democratic presidential nominees, which is the first time in my lifetime I think that presidential candidates are being asked mm -hmm. to really take this seriously. In years as I grew up, a lot of people didn't even want to talk about slavery. They just wanted to forget it. Now you find people much more willing and, shall I say, comfortable to address that issue and what it meant for the country both then and now, and that, that I think has, has fueled the willingness to talk about reparations. You know, the state of public discourse in the United States right now, uh, just trying to think a little bit about what do we mean by the word, right? And That's a question that is integral to the debate itself. In the eyes of some, reparations are just a means to a quick and easy payday. While to others, reparations would mean the United States addressing its history of slavery and oppression head on. So what do we mean by reparations? To get a general consensus, I asked Americans what their ideas were on reparations. Uh, I feel like reparations would be combating historical injustices um, on the basis of race and also combating current systemic inequality on the basis of race. A way to make things right, per se. Yeah, trying to compensate for systemic um, segregation and bias. The lining of reparations, I think, you know, setting, you know, to rights wrongs that were done, you know, however many years ago. Right. Writing wrongs. Writing things away, like she said, kind of to write wrongs. Um, you know, past wrongs, obviously. Um, I think it's just a way to, to promote equality. Um, most important. Given the history of our country, I would not be against it if there were some type of coherent plan that could address uh, the historic injustices. Uh, however, at the same time, though, my concern is if it's sort of a gimmick, so I gotta learn more about it. I'm a white guy. I'm all white. <laughs> For my purposes, I assume a broader definition, coined by James Ballner. He stated that reparations are, quote, Benefits extended in various forms to those injured by racial discrimination practiced by or with the acquiescence of the government of a representative democracy. Under this definition, reparations proposals have existed in various forms since the end of slavery. America has paid reparations to Native Americans and the survivors of Japanese internment camps of World War II. However, as a nation, we have not established reparations for African Americans. In the 19th and 20th centuries, there were several unsuccessful attempts to secure reparations to African Americans. But the most enduring proposal to date is H.R. 40, 
a bill proposed by Representative John Conyers in 1989 and every year until his retirement in 2017. The bill was later taken up by Representative Sheila Jackson in 2019, and a companion bill was introduced by Senator Cory Booker of the same year. And what we're simply saying is that this commission will study reparations and the proposals thereof, which is not something that is foreign, if you will, to this nation. It's about time we find the common ground and the common purpose to deal with the ugly past and make sure that generations ahead do not have to continue to mark disparities but can truly talk about a nation where, as our ancestors spoke from the good book, where justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. However, anti-reparations arguments have cast skepticism onto any prospects of reparations. I don't think reparations for something that happened 150 years ago for whom none of us currently living are responsible is a good idea. I, I don't think any, any person, black or white, is responsible for what someone else, black or white, did 150 years ago. While that may be true, the effects of slavery and Jim Crow segregation do show up in modern racial inequalities today. Davis Houck is an expert on the civil rights movement and the life of Emmett Till. His interest in the stories of those living under Jim Crow segregation led him to some interesting findings on black families living in the Mississippi Delta. I started doing some census research in the Mississippi Delta. You have to, you have to list how many weeks out of the year you work. Uh -huh. Every one of them, 52 weeks. Uh -huh. How many hours a week on average did you work? 60. Uh -huh. How much income did you make? Zero. Entry after entry after entry, zero. The, the rare exception you'd find somebody who'd say $120. Except that's just 1940. And I was floored just page after page, I mean, hundreds, thousands of names of all these Mississippians. And of course, you go to Alabama, you go to Georgia, you go to Louisiana, you go to Florida, and it's the same, yeah. that you have this cruel, inequitable system mm -hmm. that just continues to perpetuate itself. There's no such thing as a minimum wage, there's no such thing as overtime, there's no such thing as um, child labor laws. It's just, it's theft. Mm -hmm based on white supremacy. So how have the practices of slavery and Jim Crow segregation manifested today? Dionisi Ali Prantis is a senior research economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, and he's been researching this very question. If you would have looked in the 1960s, you would have hoped that based on the civil rights movement and some of the victories of the civil rights movement, you would have hoped that afterwards, uh, we would have seen you know, a lot of convergence in terms of racial inequality. Uh, and in some dimensions we did, uh, but in some dimensions we did not. And that's actually, you know, kind of the basis, the starting point of a lot of the research uh, that I do. You know, the, the racial wealth gap is in some senses just a very clear signal about the state of racial inequality. In our study, we were trying to understand what are the, what primarily is maintaining the racial wealth gap. If we look at the data in 1962, for example, there's a massive racial wealth gap. Then the question becomes, kind of going forward, what's, what's enabled that racial wealth gap to persist? Uh, and so we were trying to understand that question, thinking about things like just kind of the persistence of that initial distribution, thinking about um, just the ways that intergenerational transfers could make that kind of maybe a permanent thing if left, uh, left to its own devices. What we found is that actually it's almost entirely the earnings gap. It actually is something that you can uh, rationalize in a lot of senses, or you can get your head around in the sense that, you know, in some, in some basic way, you can think about wealth as just kind of accumulated income over time. It's just saved income over time. And so if you have very different earnings across groups, uh, over time, that's going to turn into very different wealth. That racial wealth gap will kind of close, not in lockstep, but very closely together with the racial earnings gap over time. If we close the racial earnings gap, the racial wealth gap should follow. Um, but the thing is, is the racial earnings gap has not changed at all since 1962. From the economist's perspective, what might be the best way to solve this issue? So there's, there's really two big issues for me that I think would be the kind of most effective immediately. So one is, um, is residential segregation, the other is K-12 education. So These are two areas of racial inequality that America has been dealing with for generations. 
Though we typically hear about these issues existing in our major cities, like my hometown of Atlanta, Georgia, which not only has around 50% black population, but also carries a history of enslavement and Jim Crow segregation. But cities like mine don't represent all of America. In small towns, African Americans face issues of racial inequality, as well as African Americans living in the North, where the history of oppression is a little bit more subtle. How do the stories of these African Americans fall into the debate of reparations? To answer that, I turn to Worcester, Ohio, a small town of about 26,000 and a black population of about 4%. With such small representation, you might think this city isn't the best place to discuss reparations and racial injustice. But even here, African Americans have had to overcome their own set of struggles. When Dr. Yvonne Williams moved to Worcester in 1959 with her family, she met this reality head on. We lived on College Avenue. And I, I remember when I'd meet particularly other black residents of town and tell them where we lived, they'd say, oh, you live north of Bowman Street. And I had no idea what, what that meant. And it was some time before I found out that there, were no, there was one black family living north of Bowman Street in this town. And that is because historically, the family had lived there for a couple generations, I guess. The south end of the town, originally white people lived, but when black people started moving in, you know, it became one of those things that they all shifted to the north, the white people shifted to the north end of town. And so it, it's come to a south side, north side thing for Worcester. A lot of the black people live there and a lot of the homes are older. You know, the cars you see on the south side of town aren't as good as the cars you see on the north end of town. For John, there seems to be a very clear socioeconomic divide in Worcester that affects its African-American citizens. It affects them partly as a result of discriminatory housing practices such as redlining in the 20th century. But how is this practice here in Worcester? As far as I could determine, realtors did not show them houses for purchase and private people would not rent to them. As a matter of fact, that's what happened to us. That first summer, it was an interim of a few months before we could move into what became our permanent home. And in that interim, a colleague offered to rent his house for the summer, their house, because they were gonna be away all summer. When people in his neighborhood, which was up north of Highland Avenue in Worcester, heard it. I remember it was Mother's Day, 1961, I think, that his neighbors actually demonstrated in the street in front of his home, protesting his intention to rent to a black family. My first reaction was anger, and then it was like, sort of amazement, how can this be happening? There was quite a little crowd in the street in front of his home. It was, it caused him great distress. We put him in the hospital and what he told us, he said, I am still willing to rent to you if you want to do it. Well, at the time I had a four year old and a brand new baby who had been born in March. And if it had just been my husband and I, we would have rented regardless. But under the circumstances, I said, I cannot keep my child in the house all summer. And it would probably be too dangerous to let her go outside to play. Because I didn't know anybody in that neighborhood. So we decided not to rent. Today, exclusionary practices such as redlining are far less common than they were in the early 20th century, allowing African Americans to move anywhere. I should be able to live wherever I want to live, you know, wherever I can afford to live or want to live. I know that you know. there are a number of black, black folks all over the city now in, in lots of different places that they certainly were not when we came to town. 
I moved to Worcester in 1992. The north side, I live on the north end of town. And sometimes black people ask me, they haven't for a couple years, why I live on the north side of town. And my simple answer is because I want to. <laughs> I live over there. I don't, I've been in the same place for, it'll be 15 years in June. Uh, it's the only place my son's known. And uh, I want my son to have the best opportunity he can have. I go out of my way to try to make sure that happens. That's important to me. It looks like wealth does not drive neighborhood selection as much as we might have thought before, or at least I might have thought. And it's really about something, something that you would call in the economics literature racial preferences. But the point is, you know, um, a black kid might not benefit from having high, uh, high educational attainment neighbors in the same way that their white counterpart would if to live in that neighborhood, they have to put up with people being very hostile towards them and they have to really be stressed about, um, yeah, just <laughs> kind of being able to encounter some basic decency. Getting some basic decency from their neighbors in the north end of Worcester is something John and his son have had to struggle with. He came home one day and he was really upset. He uh, had been out playing with his buddies and he said, Dad, those people across the street, they let all the other kids go in their backyard, but they won't let me go back there. I was, uh, was kind of hot and I got up, I marched right over there and asked him why they were doing that. He said it was because of his wife's been sick and didn't want to be responsible, but all the other kids were back there. You know, it wasn't really that difficult to see. Right. How do you explain to a eight or nine year old that they don't want you over there because your skin is black? So that question has no easy answers, but it does open the door for us to look at some issues that come with residential segregation. A big problem that comes out of residential segregation is I think we, in a lot of ways, we kind of have two societies in the United States still. And so I think residential segregation is a way that that's able to perpetuate itself. Both issues of the racial wealth gap and residential segregation are rooted in America's history and are deeply intertwined with other racial inequalities, from education to the criminal justice system. If we are ever going to solve these issues, Reparations might be a way to do it. It's at least worth looking into a little deeper. I, don't need, I wouldn't take them personally. Mm -hmm. And it's not because I'm better than anybody else, but I don't think I deserve it. And I can't understand how someone can think they deserve it. It didn't happen to you. Because it, just think about it. Were you a slave back in 1865? Neither was I. Why should I get paid for it? So I, I can't make it make sense how that is getting money is going to close that divide. This is a common defense against reparations. The amount of time that's passed since the end of slavery is a major hurdle to gaining reparations in the 21st century, especially models that call for individual payments to be made to individual people. Um, something that comes out of our research is if we think about reparations as kind of this one-time wealth transfer or kind of a one-time like I'm gonna write a check and we're gonna all be done with this right um, that unless it if it does not address the earnings gap the wealth gap will be right back and well I I do not support the idea of individual reparations well I, I have no idea how much money they're asking or thinking about but it would, it would not be in the millions, it would be in the billions, maybe even in the trillions. However, even if you set aside billion, billions, it would mean a few thousand dollars in everybody's pocket, which would soon be spent. How do you monetize land, education, work? I mean, there's so many in, in every part of life, I blocked you. Yeah. Well, how do you, mm -hmm. you know, over, over, <laughs> over yeah. several hundred years, how do you even begin to monetize that? So exactly. How do you monetize all of the opportunities African Americans were excluded from over the centuries? Turns out, it's really hard to do. 
That's why some reparations proposals take a different approach. Yes, I think reparations could be feasible. And again, not if it's directed at individuals or even at individual organizations. It has to be universal. And as I say, it has to have a structure to it. If ahead, when you start thinking about you know, potential solutions, I think one of the things that you have to really think about is the fact that you know a lot of these problems are interwoven or a lot of the what I would think of as solutions would have to be kind of like a multifaceted, multidimensional approach. Back to education and housing. And then I think I would have to add access to jobs, greater access to jobs. Reparations aren't just about money and policies to some people. In the eyes of some, it could also be a profound moment for our country historically and for the future. You know, the issue for me is there's really, there's two issues, right? So there's, there's kind of the past that there's, there's this history of kind of ugly things that happen, painful things that, you know, you wonder, can we try to find a way to compensate for that? But then there's also the, the kind of the present and the future. I think a man's got to stand on his own two feet. A man and a woman have to stand on their own two feet and be proud of what you do today. I can't live back there. You know, I know, I, I know about it. I know some of the history about it. I know about Jim Crow. I know about a other lot of terrible things that have happened. But I can't live back there. Right, because these are historical things. They're not just, this is what I feel like. It's not just that you owned me, it's that you blocked me at every point afterwards. Mm -hmm. You blocked my mobility. You blocked my education. You blocked my ability to own home. You, you know, this country was built on black labor, free labor, and yet, Black people are not given an equitable access to the fruits of that labor. Economically, they are greatly deprived. And that's why I say it needs to be structured in such a way that opens that economic door. I mean, I think there's also this very human thing about acknowledgement, right? So, I mean, I think of, you know, again, like experiences in my own life where you know, if, if one person has wronged another, how much um, just acknowledging that can go a really long way. We've talked about a lot today, from the history of reparations to the racial inequalities some proposals seek to solve. So what do we do with all of this information going forward? I, I hope that some of these, you know, these conversations, so for example, your documentary, our research, I hope they can get us to a place where we're having a more constructive conversation around it where it really is focused on how do we improve, you know, opportunity for everyone. Even if we don't write a big check, but we're forcing people to talk about it and have an opinion about it. And what's the evidence for that opinion? Is it housing? Is it the census? Is it generational wealth that's simply not happening? Is it the education gap? If there were money available for that, and that'll be very hard to do in this country, that there are a whole lot of people sleeping on the church steps down here, um, having to eat at the soup kitchen in the, at, the, at the church in the morning, because that may be the only meal they get all day. I think those people deserve that more so than I do. I have a roof over my head, my furnace works. Uh, I have a big queen size bed that I lay in. <laughs> my son is, is not hungry. So I don't need that. This is where I live. You know, um, I'm not planning to go anywhere, but this is where I live. So I want to try to make, I can't affect the whole United States, but I can affect what happens in my hometown. You know, you look around today and you see what we're still fighting, you know, the, as much as we like to think, think the movement ended in 68 or whatever. It's like, you know, we're, this, is, this new generation, we've got to fight it all over again. And it's not just about kind of trying to blame anyone and it's not trying to, you know, indict the United States for being less than perfect because every country is. But trying to really just improve our country and make it a better place for everyone that lives here. Right. That seems like a very non-controversial idea to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I want people to put their money where their mouth is. Seriously. Mm -hmm. It is time. She's right. It is time. Ultimately, however, politicians will decide whether or not reparations would be good for our country. At the very least, 
As Americans, we can acknowledge that we carry our history with us to this very day. We had no choice to inherit our ugly past from our predecessors, but we do have a choice in creating a brighter future for our descendants, the same way my parents did for me when I was a child. Thanks for watching.